morning of August the 6th, 1945, the American bomber Enola Gay took off for the Japanese archipelago. In its bomb bay was an atomic device nicknamed Little Boy. The target was Hiroshima, an industrial city with 340,000 inhabitants. At 8.15 a.m., the bomb was dropped, creating a blast equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT. A gigantic nuclear mushroom rose above the city. The temperature at ground zero reached 4,000 degrees. Seventy thousand were killed outright. The city was totally annihilated. It was as if we dropped a million conventional bombs on the city. One million bombs. The irradiation would continue to claim numerous victims for dozens of years. The total death toll in Hiroshima was 140,000. The level of devastation from one small weapon was unprecedented in humankind. Three days after Hiroshima, a second atomic bomb was dropped over the city of Nagasaki, immediately killing 45,000. These two bombs dealt a final blow to the Japanese Empire, which surrendered on September the 2nd, 1945. The Second World War was over. The United States was hoisted to the rank of superpower. Am I proud? I, I, think, I think that the way the war ended so fast and saved many lives. In that sense, I'm proud of what I did. I'm not proud of a mass destruction. But what is less well known is that Germany had been leading the way. The Americans were convinced that Hitler was on the point of acquiring a nuclear weapon, and they were going to do everything to prevent him from getting there first. This is very important. If the Germans get this bomb before we do, Hitler will win. And the world will be dominated by the Third Reich for a thousand years. Hitler had an 18-month start, so it was urgent. The Americans launched the biggest secret operation of all time, a colossal budget of $26 billion and the world's best scientists. Codename, Project Manhattan. The scientists engaged on this project were fanatic about trying to solve it and make sure that it was going to work and that it would be delivered on time. There was tremendous pressure on them. The project was top secret. 600,000 people were working on ultra-secure sites throughout the United States, hidden away from the eyes of the world. Not even the US Congress was kept in the loop. Security, security, security was the key in Los Alamos. I mean, everybody lived and breathed security 24-7, constantly. An astonishing race against time, played out in parallel, this time between themselves and their allies, as the Soviets, too, were desperate for the bomb. This race at the end of the war about brain power from the German scientists and uranium was a great competition uh, between the Allied forces. And the Allies had no hesitation in using spies. He was one of the most cleverest and most brilliant scientists ever to be involved in that. Klaus Fuchs was probably the most important spy ever in the history of espionage. We're going to reveal to you the story of this incredible secret competition, an insane race with no holes barred, and with the destiny of the world at stake. Early 1930s, 
Adolf Hitler had just been appointed Chancellor of the Reich. Though the country had become militarily one of the most powerful in the world, it also led in another domain, that of science. Germany was a pioneer in disciplines such as chemistry and physics. For almost 40 years, it had been the nation with the most Nobel Prize winners, such as Max Planck, the energy specialist, Albert Einstein, and a certain Werner Heisenberg, one of the most brilliant atomic researchers in the land, generally thought of as a genius. To the eyes of the world, Germany seemed to be an extremely scientifically advanced country. In the world of intelligence, they had codes and Enigma, the encoding machine. In terms of weapons, they had the most modern aircraft, and Germany had a place apart, a breeding ground for science and scholars. But Hitler's anti-Semitic laws led to the exile of many brilliant scientists, including Albert Einstein, who settled in the USA. It all began one day in August 1939, when Einstein was vacationing on the East Coast, on the residential Long Island. His vacation would be less peaceful than planned. That day, he received a visit from one of his colleagues and friends, Leo Zilard, a Jewish-Hungarian physicist who had also left his country when faced with the rise of Nazism. He had come to make a highly important revelation to Einstein. On the terrace of his holiday home, he explained how Germany was exploiting a new source of energy, uranium, which could lead to the creation of devastating weapons. Without delay, Einstein decided to write a letter to the President of the United States himself, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And this is what he explained. I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from the Czechoslovakian mines, which he has taken over. The uranium will in the near future be converted into a new source of energy. This new phenomenon might also lead to bombs of a new type being constructed. A single bomb of this type, carried by boat and exploded in a port, might very well destroy the whole port, together with some of the surrounding territory. It doesn't mince his words. He says that the Germans are working on this project and it will be enormously destructive. He thinks it's very important that the president be aware of this and understand that this could mean the beginning of some kind of German bomb program. Roosevelt became aware of the letter and the information terrified him. He was right to be worried. As at the same time, events in Europe were moving along a pace. In September 1939, Hitler first sent his troops to attack Poland, then to conquer France, and finally to threaten Great Britain. The Second World War was underway. In just a few months, Hitler had conquered a large part of Europe. But with war looming, American public opinion forced Roosevelt to remain neutral. Yet it was impossible to stand still and watch as a nation as powerful as Germany gained possession of a weapon of mass destruction. The USA needed absolutely to have the same thing in order to defend itself should the need arise, which is just what Roosevelt told his advisors. Roosevelt listens and says, I see what you're telling me is that we have to be careful that our neighbor doesn't blow us up. We'll do something about this, says the president. So as not to be left behind, Roosevelt summoned scientists entrusted with a feasibility study for the atomic bomb. At that point, the project was very small, just a dozen men and a budget of barely $100,000. But one event turned everything upside down. On December the 7th, 1941, Japan, Germany's ally, attacked the US fleet at its Pearl Harbor base in the Pacific. The United States joined the war. I ask 
that the Congress declare a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Just days later, it was Hitler's turn to declare war on the United States. Now the country could become one of Germany's targets. The Allies are very conscious that Germany is an immense power, both in terms of its military and its scientists. Uh, they are frightened. They knew that Hitler was a ruthless man, that he would not hesitate to use this bomb if he had a chance. If they could get the bomb first, then they would probably use it on London or Washington. Building an atomic device became Roosevelt's absolute priority, and he was convinced that Germany and the USA were locked in a race against the clock. Whoever had the bomb first would win, and according to the president, the Reich already had a head start. They might be as much as a year or a year and a half ahead of the United States program. And that could mean that they could have a bomb by Christmas of 43, summer of 1944, and it would be devastating. To make an atomic bomb, something no one has ever done, and also claw back an 18-month lead, Roosevelt's challenge appeared insane. So he pulled out all the stops. In all, more than 600,000 people were recruited. Factories and entire towns were erected in just months. In spanking new laboratories, the world's best scientists worked on the most absolute secrets with unlimited resources. The code name for this groundbreaking military program was Project Manhattan. At its head, two men with radically different profiles, Leslie Groves, the soldier, and Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist. Groves was chosen by Roosevelt himself to run the program. The man had an extraordinary profile. He was both a general and an engineer, and his experience was unquestioned. He had built the Pentagon, the biggest headquarters of any of the world's military forces. General Groves has been called the indispensable man of the Manhattan Project. He was a dynamo. He had more energy. He was more decisive than anyone among his peers, or at least it seems so. He said any difficult problem should be solved within one hour. He was a tall, bulky, domineering, powerful. He said, all right, and he immediately went to work. His first mission, to find the man to lead the scientists. He selected Oppenheimer, a brilliant physicist who taught in California at Berkeley. But his choice stunned the scientific community because Oppenheimer wasn't seen as the best in his field. People said, Groves is choosing Oppenheimer. That's very strange. Oppenheimer has never, he's never administered anything. He's never uh, accomplished uh, what some of these other scientists uh, there were already Nobel Prize winners uh, participating in the early stages of the, of the project. But Groves always chose younger people who still had a lot of energy and ambition to achieve a goal. And he saw that in Oppenheimer. He saw it immediately. The choice was all the more surprising in that Oppenheimer's style was far removed from that of the authoritarian and uncompromising Groves. So Oppenheimer, in contrast, he looks like a very sensitive poet, which he was. He carried in his pocket the poetry of Baudelaire. He was uh, really an operatic character. He was a philosopher. He spoke seven languages. He studied the Indian scriptures. He was um, a hugely sensitive man. Despite significant differences between the two men, Roosevelt put all his trust in the duo and gave them carte blanche. Groves' responsibilities from the outset were ones of uh, extraordinary power. He had uh, the full resources of the U.S. government behind him, uh, any amount of money that he wanted. Um, he could have anything that he needed. He saw early on that there was going to be a competition for resources, and thus he needed first priority on any material that he wanted, 
if it was copper or gold or silver or anything, he had to have first priority. Groves' first problem, where to create the infrastructure to make the bomb? They couldn't build it in a laboratory in a city. The equipment needed was colossal. The uranium enrichment plant alone was one kilometer long, and there were other demands. Groves wanted the sites to be isolated because they were top secret. He didn't want people to know. They were also dealing with first-of-the-kind facilities, uh, building a nuclear reactor uh, that would get to be uh, two and three thousand degrees in the center, and you know, for all they knew, they could blow up. They had not built one of these. You know, they had to plan um, for a buffer zone to make sure that there were no people in anywhere near these facilities in case something went wrong. In addition, Groves didn't want the bomb built on just one site, but on three. As being unknown territory, they had to try several methods. A first, immense complex was built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to make uranium. Then a second in Hanford, near Seattle, to produce plutonium. They had yet to find the ideal location for the third site, the most crucial, the one where the bomb would be assembled. And that required an even more isolated, even more secret location. Groves was at a loss. Oppenheimer had an idea. In November 1942, he took Groves to the American Southwest, New Mexico. Oppenheimer knew the area because he had a ranch in New Mexico and loved New Mexico. It was, it's a beautiful place, it's, it's gorgeous. And um, they go around and, and Groves is saying, no, not this place, not this place, not this place. Do you, and he says to Oppenheimer, do you know any other places? And Oppenheimer says, well, there's this school. There's this Los Alamos Ranch School up on the Mesa over here. Groves and Oppenheimer come upon this scene of boys out exercising and immediately Groves said, this is it, that's it. So they closed the school, they got the boys off, off and they took over what was already a beginning of a uh, uh, place to live and stay. It was here at Los Alamos on these extreme lands at 2,500 meters altitude that the largest atomic laboratory was created. And it was here that Oppenheimer intended to bring the world's best scientists. The problem was he had to convince them. How could he persuade them to drop everything and move to the middle of nowhere for an unspecified period. More pertinently, how could Oppenheimer get them to work on a project that no one knew would even work? That's part of Groves's and Oppenheimer's dilemma. I mean, they don't know that it's gonna work. Maybe it wouldn't work. Maybe it would be a failure, Press the button, <clears throat> nothing happened. I mean, maybe it, maybe, you know, maybe it failed. Maybe it was a failure. Oppenheimer had a tricky task. So to recruit the best brains, he took his pilgrim staff and crisscrossed the United States. For a year, one after another, he tried to convince them, one after another, with an irrefutable argument. This is what he said that what they were working on might not only end this war, but possibly all future wars. So he put it to them in a way that was drawing upon their patriotism, drawing upon their visceral hatred of Germany and Hitler and his anti-Semitic regime. And it was quite compelling. For, for many of the scientists. Though Einstein wasn't authorized to take part in the project because of his pacifist leanings, Oppenheimer's gamble paid off. He had assembled the best scientists in the world, among them 20 Nobel Prize winners. In the spring of 1943, they came to the New Mexico desert and Los Alamos. Meantime, 
time, what was a boarding school for boys had become a real town. Mobile homes as far as the eye could see. There were offices, assembly workshops, laboratories, as well as a hospital and supermarkets. An almost normal town where security was omnipresent. Barbed wire all around. Military police patrols around the clock. In all, 7,000 people lived here. Along with the soldiers and scientists were all the personnel needed to keep a town running laborers and administrators. There were also housewives who had followed their husbands and their children. Dimas Chavez was six when he moved to Los Alamos in August 1943. His father had just been hired to build more laboratories. When he arrived, he saw that he had just entered the most secret town on earth. First of all, we came to a, a, a main gate that was manned by armed military police and Dad had already filled out all the appropriate paperwork and so forth that authorized him to come to Los Alamos. And then they took pictures of us. We had to have an ID badge. And uh, the MP told my father, he said, okay, now get in your vehicle and proceed on this road and there will be another checkpoint about a mile down the road and you are going to be given a certain amount of time when you leave here to when you get there. And if you don't get in there in the prescribed period of time, people will come after you. I, I didn't know what in the world was going on. If, if Dad had a flat tire or what have you, what would happen to us? Fortunately, everything went fine. We slipped right in. At the same time, a young soldier from New York arrived at Los Alamos. His name was Benjamin Bederson, and he was 19. Benjamin had studied physics at university for two years before joining the army. One day, his officers proposed him as assistant physicist on a military project. He had no idea that he was going to be working on the atom bomb. The program was top secret, yet he accepted the job. He was expecting a military base. But when he got there, he was stunned. There were scientists everywhere. We were in, in the middle of nowhere, uh, in, a, in a city that was just being built. But, and there were a lot of civilians from all over the world, mostly from Europe and America. <laughs> they were, imagine, imagine all the world scientists were there. They were all physics people and mathematicians. And uh, everyone I knew was, was an interesting person. Benjamin understood that his mission would be linked to science. Like himself, 99% of employees didn't know what they were working on. That was General Groves' aim, to keep the secret. It was the biggest secret of the war, it is, so it is said. And um, the very fact that there was a bomb program, you know, is a secret in itself. And had the Germans known that the Americans were working on an atomic bomb, maybe they would have uh, done more than they did. Groves was obsessed by the notion that Hitler might get the bomb first. Germany led the world in science, he knew that, and things were getting urgent. The man about whom he was wariest was the famous atomic physicist Werner Heisenberg. He had stayed with Hitler rather than choose exile. He was the German scientist Groves saw as the greatest threat. If anyone would be in charge of this program, it would be he. And that if anyone would be able to think his way through to a bomb, it would be he. Groves feared Heisenberg's talents in this race against time. So he stepped up security. To keep things secret, he imposed job compartmentalization. Each person, from scholar to laborer, would have only one task to carry out and would not be authorized to talk about it. Information was thus reduced to a minimum, and nobody knew the finality of the project. Work conditions so surprising that people began to wonder. Dad had access to many, many, many restricted areas. But did he know what was going on? No, he had a job to do. He had a a hole to dig there, or something to move over there, or what have you, and as soon as he was finished, he would be changed to another area. 
we would talk about it, but dad would immediately say, you're not supposed to know, I'm not supposed to know, don't say anything about it, period. So it would just end like that. I was immediately given a job and my boss was a Brit was from, from England and he had just he was a professor in England and he was a physics professor so I knew that I, that I was doing physics but I had no idea what it was of course But after a few weeks spent with renowned British scientists Benjamin was let in on the secret when he was transferred to the explosives department. He learned that he was building an atomic bomb. I was blowing up things. I had steel tubes and I had explosives and I had a um, photographic technique to measure the timing of the explosions. But mainly we were just blowing up things to see how they survived under, under explosions. That's what I was doing, just testing materials for, for uh, their ability to withstand an explosion. I was very happy. It was very exciting to know that I was doing real physics, and here I was in the Army with the world exploding around me. Uh, people were dying all over the world. And I was doing physics. I couldn't believe my luck. Benjamin was now among the 1% of initiates. Among this minority, the rules were drastic. The scientists were strictly forbidden to talk about the bomb, even with their wives at home in the evening. And between themselves, they had to use coded language. You couldn't say bomb. It was called, it was called the gadget. The word bomb was never used in public. None of, no, none of those words, uh, fission, fusion, uh, chain reaction, neutron, all those words, were never used outside the tech area. All over the camp, giant signs provided reminders of the ground rules. Well, I was dying to tell what was going on, but I knew I shouldn't. I, it was certainly a temptation to say what was going on. The secret was really important, and we knew that. Despite these constraints, Americans hurried to be part of the project. The country was, at the time, undergoing a serious economic depression. The Great Depression had pushed unemployment up to its highest level. Here was the assurance of a job and a home paid for by the state. Demas' father didn't hesitate for a second. After years of uncertainty, working at Los Alamos allowed him to look after his family. It was his job. Uh, he had no other job. And my gosh, I mean, where else could you live uh, on a rent where we, uh, our rent was $16 a month at the log cabin. Uh, our food was uh, available through military uh, prices and so forth. Uh, my dad wasn't rolling in a lot of money, uh, but what he made, he, he took care of us. An everyday routine rapidly fell into place. The children attended school. There was a cinema, a theater, and a few shops. Enough to keep the inhabitants busy, as they were not allowed to leave town. Each found entertainment where he could. There was a lot of sports. There was, uh, men got involved with basketball, with softball, with baseball. Uh, scientists who had uh, musical ability formed bands. Uh, music was an outlet. Uh, there was a variety of bands that uh, formed. There was dancing every weekend. Fridays and Saturdays, everybody danced. But even on Saturday nights, Big Brother wasn't far away. The bartenders were um, agents who were listening to their conversations. And if someone had gotten um, a little too drunk and loose uh, with his 
conversation and was talking too much about what he was working on, he would be quickly whisked away from the bar. And for those who were a little too chatty, there was no second chance. If there was someone who was a security risk, uh, that person would be um, sent to some other assignment, such as in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. I mean, they would be getting, they would get rid of them, um, but they couldn't just let them go free to uh, back to civilian life. They'd go somewhere, they could keep tabs on them. In this high security environment, the scientists worked hard. But by January 1944, one year after Project Manhattan had begun, panic had set in. They still didn't have a bomb. It wasn't even possible to say whether they'd have one before the Germans. And Groves had a major new problem to face, as after Germany, a second rival had appeared in this race against time. But this time, it was an ally. The Soviet Union. For months, the country had been struggling to cope with the bloody German invasion. Operation Barbarossa had begun on June 22, 1941. Four million Axis soldiers dispatched to take the USSR by surprise. The fighting was merciless, but amidst all the chaos, one man was worried about another threat, a physicist, Georgi Flirov. He had noticed that a flood of articles written by German and American scholars about radioactive elements had suddenly dried up. He suspected that researchers were engaged in making an atomic bomb. So he went to the library to see, is there anything in the American journals or other journals? And he found there wasn't anything. And he looked at the German journals and saw everything on nuclear fission had disappeared. So he concluded like the uh, Sherlock Holmes story, that the dog that doesn't bark in the night gives the clue that something must be going on. Then, in April 1942, he wrote a letter to Stalin to warn of the consequences of the development of such a weapon. The results will exceed what we now know so totally that there will be no need to determine who was to blame for the fact that this work has been neglected in our country. So, in turn, in early 1943, Stalin launched a program to develop an atomic bomb. Nothing like the Manhattan Project. Only a hundred or so scientists were hired, and research began here in this tent outside Moscow. The Manhattan Project was the Rolls Royce. The Soviet project wasn't even a Model T Ford, it was a push bike. The scientists working there did so mainly with paper and pencil. They were living in great material poverty. There was no nuclear reactor, and there wasn't even any uranium, much less plutonium. There were no raw materials for a bomb. The Soviets had none of that. But they knew what they could do if they had the resources. The USSR, it must be said, was ruined. The war had already cost them millions of lives. A Soviet counteroffensive was underway on every front. All available resources were mobilized. Scientific research was far from being Stalin's priority. The Soviet Union was a third world country, incomparably poorer than the United States. There were therefore few resources to allocate to research, whether fundamental or applied. Everything went to the war effort. There was, however, one area where the USSR excelled that would prove crucial, espionage. And one of their spies was particularly productive. He sent them all the American advances on the bomb. He managed to spy in the most secure town in the world, Los Alamos. His name was Klaus Fuchs. Klaus Fuchs was probably the most important spy ever in the history of espionage because he was one of the most cleverest and most brilliant scientists ever to be involved in that. Fuchs was of German stock, from a middle-class family with a minister father. At 17, when Hitler seized power, he became an opponent of the Nazi and joined the Communist Party. He makes it very clear, I think, 
that one of the biggest threats he sees to German society is the growth of the right wing and Nazism. And I think that he believes that the Communist Party are the only people who will stand up to the Nazis. And for a man like Fuchs, that would have been a really fundamental commitment in his life. A confirmed communist, he left Nazi Germany for Great Britain, where he began to study physics. He obtained British nationality, and his profile as a physicist grew quickly. He was then recruited to work on the British atomic bomb project that began in 1940, two years before the Manhattan Project. But his political convictions led him straight to the Russian embassy in London, where he offered his services to the USSR. As soon as Germany attacked the Soviet Union, he went to the Soviet embassy in London and said, I know about this, I can tell you about my work. He knows that work is being done to create a uranium atom bomb, and he's invited to work on that program, and he believes that he has a duty to tell the Communist Party, the GRU, and the Soviet Union. At that point, he has become a spy. In two years, Fuchs passed to the USSR 570 pages of calculations and descriptions of the construction of an atomic bomb. It was the result of everything Great Britain had discovered. But he went even further because in late 1942, General Groves asked the Allies to send their best scientists to the USA to accelerate research on the bomb. Fuchs, the eminent physicist, was also invited along on the trip. In November 1943, he arrived in the United States. The Russian spy was taken on board the Manhattan Project. There, he would have access to all top secret information. The Allies had no idea they were being spied on. Groves had one obsession. Though his bomb would not be finished for several months, he still didn't know whether Hitler was ready to launch his own. To find out, he had to interrogate the scientists who had remained in Germany. First among them, Werner Heisenberg, who was heading up the German program. The only way to get to him was to send men into the field. But that would have to wait for spring 1944 and the liberation of Europe. Early in the morning of the 6th of June, 130,000 men landed on beaches in Normandy. It was the largest military operation of all time. Among the Allied soldiers, there were also American civilians, men whose objective wasn't to liberate Europe from the Nazi yoke. They were scientists in soldiers' uniforms, 20 of them sent by Groves personally. Their mission was to find out the exact state of advancement of the German bomb. He needed to have his own intelligence and counterintelligence forces. He needed to have his own eyes and ears, his own men there. This special new kind of spy unit was the Alsace mission. It was headed by a certain Samuel Goodsmith. This 45-year-old Netherlander taught physics at the University of Michigan, but during the 1930s had rubbed shoulders with the most brilliant German scientists. Some were even his friends, privileged contacts that could come in very useful in obtaining information. He fits a lot of parameters for the ideal person to go track down the scientists and interrogate them. Following the advance of the Allied troops in France, Goodsmith and his men arrived on November the 25th, 1944, in a place of particular interest, Strasbourg. The city had become a showcase of the Reich for scientific research. This is where Alsos hoped to pick up the trail of Werner Heisenberg. It was he who could give them information on the German bomb. On arrival at the University of Strasbourg, Goodsmith found documents and an address that could enable him to locate Heisenberg.
Gutschmidt discovers, and it's very exciting news, that Heisenberg, the central figure he's looking for, is not in Berlin, which is being bombed to destruction at that point in the war, but has moved to Heschingen, where, in fact, in the Black Forest, the, uh, what's, what there is of the German bomb program has been moved. Heschingen, a small town that Gutsmit and his men would never have considered, was lost in the Black Forest some 60 kilometers from Stuttgart. According to the Alsos mission, it was the perfect place to hide a laboratory. Gutsmit knew he was close to reaching his goal, but had further surprises in store, as he wasn't the only one interested in German atomic research. He had to contend with the French, he realized that when, on April the 24th, 1945, the Alsos mission finally arrived in sight of Heschingen, the town was just the other side of a bridge. But the problem was, another army was already stationed there and ready to enter the town. The French Liberation Army. Nothing serious. They were allies after all. But when it came to headhunting scientists, it was every man for himself. And the French, after five years of war, were only just beginning their nuclear program. The French have their own intelligence program and would like to capture some of these scientists for post-war France. So there is a lot of competition to get to these scientists first. If the French were to capture Heisenberg, they would, in all probability, keep him to themselves. It was a tricky situation. It was vital that the Alsace mission prevent the first French army from advancing. But what could they do? The Americans tried bluffing. They do or say, wait, it's about to be bombed. You don't want to go in there. Our planes are coming. And the, uh, the French officers say, all right, we'll wait. And the Alsace people run in. As a result, the first army stood firm and didn't enter Heschingen. The Alsos mission hurried on in. At the address found in Strasbourg University, they found a church. And when they searched it, they hit the jackpot. In the crypt, Gutsmit found a secret laboratory and a huge reactor. But amid the drama, it turned out it wasn't a bomb at all, but an atomic battery that could only be used to make electricity. The Alsos team was relieved. Two weeks later, it picked up Heisenberg. He confirmed that Germany was still a long way off mastering atomic energy. There, there's nothing there. there. There's no program. There's no effort. There's no collaboration of uh, German science, and the German military and German industry to make a Manhattan Project of their own. Hitler didn't support the atomic bomb work in Germany. He felt that it wasn't necessary, that they were going to finish the war. Heisenberg had told Hitler it was going to take 10 years and, you know, millions of dollars. Uh, and Hitler said, that's not worth it. We'll be done with the war long, long before then. The Americans have, therefore, nothing further to fear from the Germans. But what they do discover is they have a new adversary, an ultra-determined rival they hadn't considered, one which will turn out to be particularly dangerous the USSR. For the Soviets, too, hoped to scoop up as many scientists as they could from Germany, along with the material to build their bomb. The Americans had to play a close game in Germany. A new arms race had begun. Even though the war is not yet over, um, our ally, uh, there are some indications that um, some people already see the Russians, the Soviet Union, as the next competition, the next potential enemy. Especially since the Soviets had also organized a scientific mission to loot on German soil. It was led by the highly motivated, brilliant physicist Yuli Kariton. Cariton was totally starved of all the material he needed to experiment and to build and was the man in the field who was able to say, I want this installation, dismantle it and send it to the Soviet Union. I want this material. We definitely need that oscilloscope. This time, the Russians were every bit the equal of the American mission. 
The resources that the Soviets poured into Alsace were colossal compared to their general state of poverty. The greatest Soviet atomic scientists went to Germany. For the two months they were hunting German scientists and material, the Soviet program ground to a halt. Everyone had gone to Germany, led by Kariton. The reason that the USSR had spared no expense on this mission was because building an atomic bomb required uranium, and the country didn't have enough. Only seven tons when 200 were needed, and it happened to be found in Germany. You don't go looking for an atomic bomb sitting on a shelf with a pretty bow tied around it. You go looking in the industrial bases for the raw material of uranium to try to accelerate the Soviet program. But the Soviets know that the Germans have a stock of uranium. For one simple reason, the Germans occupied Czechoslovakia in 1938, and the only big uranium mine known at the time was in Joachimstal in Czechoslovakia. So the Soviets did accumulate uranium during the war. But the Americans, who still didn't yet have the bomb, didn't want the USSR to find that uranium. Groves understands, yes, the, so the US will have the bomb, but he wants to make sure the American monopoly will last as long as possible. Because it's, because uh, that makes America more powerful. The thing is, at the beginning of 1945, the Americans were already lagging behind. While they were stuck in the Ardennes, the Red Army, with its scientists, had already entered Germany from the east and was advancing on Berlin. The Soviets were liable to get their hands on the uranium stocks first, in this factory close to Berlin, which produced it. But General Groves had foreseen everything. They discover in Strasbourg a lot of documents relating to the German atomic project. And apparently in those documents it said that uh, there was a group at the um, Our Gesellschaft plant in Oranienburg that produced the metal for the project. So he then requested that the uh, US Army Air Force bomb the plant. On March the 15th, 1945, 600 US bombers dropped 1,500 tons of explosives and incendiary bombs on the plant. The unprecedented scale of the bombing destroyed the entire stock of uranium. 100 tons in all, a clear act of hostility against its Soviet ally. The plant wasn't part of the German war effort. It made uranium oxides, but it was just to stop the Soviets having it. And it was Groves in person who gave the order to the head of the US Army Air Force to flatten that factory. That shows the extent of the power visited upon him, and it was also to deprive the Soviets of it. The Cold War hadn't started, but they were intervening directly to deny an ally access to essential material. The Americans went even further to deprive the Russians of this uranium. This time, they clearly flouted international laws. One month after the bombing of Oranienburg, the Alsace men finally made it to Germany and found out from captured German scientists that the real stock of uranium was kept under guard in Stassfurt, 200 kilometers from the capital. A treasure trove of 1,200 tons of uranium it was imperative that they retrieve it before the Russians. The problem was, the town was part of the Russian-occupied zone, as laid out in the Yalta agreements. Groves couldn't care less, and ordered his men to dash to Stashford. In secret, in the middle of the night, they loaded the uranium into the vehicles. Wave upon wave of trucks took the stock to Great Britain. When the Red Army arrived several days later, there was nothing left. The Soviet Union knew what had happened, and they made some protests not about the seizing of the uranium, but about the fact that US troops had crossed into an area that was supposed to be part of the Soviet zone of occupation. They had no right to do that. Are you sure they've no right to do that? The rule of law in war 
is that when I beat my enemy, I have the right to spoils. Who beat the German army in Saxony? The US army. Consequently, it can be considered as the spoils of war. That's how the Americans justified it. In truth, of course, it was a violation of the Yalta agreements as they should leave all the infrastructure. This isn't infrastructure, it's raw materials. So they were playing with words. But quite honestly, Groves was an extremely straight guy, fairly brutal. He couldn't care less about the legal quibbling. What he wants is for the Soviets not to have those 1,200 tons of uranium. But Groves didn't totally achieve his aim. Because at the same time, the Russians too found something. Yuli Kariton learnt that there was uranium in another town called Neustadt. But that's a very common name in Germany. Twenty towns shared the name, and ten of them were in the Soviet zone. So they searched them all with a fine tooth comb. Kariton himself went there with his little Geiger counter. He went there with Zeldovich, and they began one, two, three, four, five, nothing. Six, seven, eight, nine, nothing. They get desperate, and there's only one left, and bingo, that's the one. Neustadt and Gleve, in a large leather tannery, which had already been requisitioned by the Soviets. There, Cariton discovered a warehouse with huge piles of casks. The problem was, they were full of lead. The lead reduced the radiation and prevented Cariton's Geiger counter from working. So there was nothing conclusive. He wondered whether the clocking was down to natural background radioactivity. So he dropped it and left. Then he had a bad night's sleep and told his colleagues, we're going back there. And I think it was on the third visit that finally he had the lead casks unsealed and saw his Geiger counter go through the roof as he had found the hundred tons of highly enriched uranium oxide which was immediately sent to the Soviet Union. 100 tons is enough to start a program. Not quite enough, but a good start. And the Russians were able to make great strides, as they were soon to receive the manual of how to make a turnkey atomic bomb. This was passed on by their spy, Klaus Fuchs, who had infiltrated the Allies. After spending eight months in a New York laboratory, he became one of the best theoreticians in the world. This knowledge was vital to the research into the making of the gadget. So he managed, in 1944, to be transferred to Los Alamos. There, he obtained a key position. More importantly, one that afforded him an overall view of the bomb. He was in the theoretical division, working on this absolutely key problem of how to detonate a plutonium bomb, what the implosion mechanism is. And the theoretical division um, was rather open to discussion. So Fuchs was in a position actually to have a very clear idea of the design of the bomb, of the problems that are, would arise in using plutonium for a bomb. Fuchs worked hard, 18 hours a day. He was respected by his colleagues, even the most eminent. And as a good spy, he managed to win their trust. He was a very quiet, law-abiding um, person. He, uh, you know, he babysat for the children of his colleagues at Los Alamos. Uh, he was uh, very polite, reserved. Uh, he seemed to be the last person to, um, uh, to be a spy, but of course he was the first person to be a, a spy. He knew so many details. He knew, you know, what uh, the bomb casing looked like, what the inside lenses looked like, what the initiator looked like, all of these details that um, most people in the project wouldn't have known all of it, but he had been so trusted and he was so involved in, in the work that he had knowledge of this. Fuchs was able to pass all this top-secret information to Moscow thanks to the privilege afforded his status. Exceptionally, he was authorized to leave Los Alamos. His contact was Harry Gold, 
an American communist recruited by the Soviet secret services. For a year, Fuchs and his messenger met up sporadically. But on June the 6th, 1945, the meeting between the two men was capital. Fuchs handed gold the documents that would save the USSR 18 months of research and $26 billion. Fuchs leaves Los Alamos in his car, drives out to Santa Fe. It's in the evening. They go to a bridge that's in a public park just outside of Santa Fe. It's overlooking the town. And then um, Fuchs hands over a large bundle of documents. Fuchs supplied uh, a description, a detailed description of the plutonium bomb and with all the relevant dimensions and all the different components of the bomb. Uh, and this was extremely important information, which the Soviet uh, scientists had no way of discovering themselves by that point because they had no samples of plutonium to an analyze. Uh, and the Soviet scientists decided they would take this design as the basis for their own first bomb. That same day, Fuchs warned them the bomb was nearly ready and would be tested in the near future. Several weeks later, on July the 17th, 1945, the Allied powers convened in Potsdam, near Berlin, represented by Harry Truman, the new US president, Joseph Stalin, and Winston Churchill. Germany had surrendered two months earlier, and the Allies had to prepare the post-war period and split the spoils. The Soviet leader thought he was in a strong position, with the Red Army controlling most of Central Europe. But what Stalin didn't know was that Truman held a major trump card, the atomic bomb test the previous day. Just after sunrise on July the 16th, 1945, at Alamogordo in the New Mexico desert, in the greatest secrecy, the first nuclear explosion in history was about to be detonated, testing an implosion device containing six kilos of plutonium, codenamed Trinity. The bomb was so complex that nobody knew whether or not it would work. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, ignition. At 5.30 a.m., the bomb's detonation released the energy equivalent to 21 kilotons of TNT. The explosion was visible over a 300-kilometer radius. It was a total success. The USA had the ultimate weapon. Truman, who had just arrived at the Potsdam Conference, heard the news via a coded telegram from General Groves. Operated on this morning. Diagnosis not yet complete, but results seem satisfactory and already exceed expectations. Truman didn't grasp the importance of this message at his first meeting with Stalin. Negotiations continued, but then Truman received a detailed account of Trinity's explosion. He saw that the bomb was a total success. Doctor has just returned most enthusiastic and confident that little boy is as husky as his big brother. The light in his eyes, discernible from here to high hold, and I could have heard his screams from here to my farm. The situation was turned on its head. Truman now knew that he was in a position of strength. He even decided to announce the news to Stalin. It happened quickly. It lasted a minute. Stalin was leaving the conference hall. Truman ran after him and casually informed him, We've just tested a bomb of terrifying effectiveness that is capable of destroying a whole city. Stalin merely said, Spasiba. Thank you. That's all. Truman had in his hands a revolutionary diplomatic weapon. His message to Stalin was clear. You have the world's biggest conventional army, most probably the best, the Red Army and its 300 divisions. You think you hold the trump card, but I show up with a trump that dwarfs yours. So when it comes to talks, it's no longer you who has the big stick, it's me. 
This is Act 1 of what was called nuclear diplomacy. Now it was the United States who could dictate conditions. With this bomb, Truman had no need for Soviet help in obtaining Japan's surrender. He even brushed Stalin aside at the signature of the Allies' final declaration, an insult to the Soviet leader. The Cold War began in Potsdam. Four days after the end of the conference and only three weeks after the Trinity test, the United States launched their two atomic bombs on the Japanese Empire. The first, on Hiroshima, was a uranium bomb. The second, over Nagasaki, was a plutonium bomb. They ushered in the threat of a nuclear war, a major risk to the future of modern civilization. After the United States, seven other countries managed to acquire nuclear weapons. The USSR in 1949, Great Britain three years later, France in 1960. This race for the ultimate weapon considerably changed relationships between the great powers. Since they have obtained the means of mutually assured destruction, they are forced to resort to diplomacy. That's why it's called a nuclear deterrent. Today, the issue is no longer how to win the war, but how to avoid the war.